the entire New Testament because it kind of starts off by prefacing it saying, I'm the one who has perfect understanding of all things. <laughs> and then it goes on to say that, that Elizabeth and Zacharias were perfectly obedient to the law. And I'm like, wait a minute, the whole New Testament says you can't do that. <laughs> but this is the one that says I've got perfect understanding. I love it. Uh-oh. Can't wait to rock on. <laughs> Welcome to To Knock Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of A Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael. The man's go back. Welcome back, sir. How are you this particular day? Thank God. I'm doing well. Baruch Hashem. Bur- Baruch Hashem. That's great. That's great. Uh, we are knocking these things out one at a time, aren't we? I'm hitting, it's scary. Uh, Luke chapter one. Would you you call that the Luke's a hazard? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's funny. That's great. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is one thing that always amazed me. Uh, this particular one of of the entire New Testament because it kind of starts off by prefacing it saying, "I'm the one who has perfect understanding of all things," <laughs> and then it goes on to say that that Elizabeth and uh, and Zach- Zacharias were perfect, like perfectly obedient to the law. And I'm like, wait a minute, the whole New Testament says you can't do that. <laughs> but this is the one that says I've got perfect understanding. I love it. Uh-oh. Can't wait to rock on. <laughs> exactly. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, Rabbi, take this thing to the park. So, you know, people always would joke. I mean, I don't know how much truth there is to this, but I used to always hear this, that um, all the... New Testament writers were Jewish, except for Luke, um, but he was a doctor, so he's almost Jewish. That was a joke I would always hear. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if any of that's true, but what's interesting is that Luke, of all the gospel writers, tries to be um, the most historical and that he gives a lot of detail. And the problem is that when you try to give a lot of detail, you set yourself up for problems. You know, it's uh, in, in law. That's a good point. So often what happens in a, in a trial is that the attorneys love to get um, a defendant, for example, to, to speak a lot. Because the more someone speaks, the more chance they're going to trip themselves up. And it seems that that happens to Luke quite a bit. So... What's interesting is that the first four verses here, the first very first four verses, I think really um, is problematic, at least for evangelical um, conservative Christians, because basically what conservative evangelical Christians uh, tend to do is they view the not just the gospel writers, but all of the writers of the Christian scriptures, they view them basically like prophets um, who received their revelation from God. And Luke here presents a very different perspective. I mean, that, that out of the starting gate, Luke makes it very clear that he did not receive a divine revelation about the stories he's going to tell. Um, Rather than say that he received his gospel through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, Luke here says the following. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us. And it seemed fitting, Luke says, for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you. So what Luke is basically saying here is that he conducted some, he did some research. He tried to 
find uh, early reports about what happened in the life of Jesus, and he checked them out. He didn't just necessarily accept everything at face value, and he basically put together his gospel based upon these prior accounts. He's not saying that the stories he's going to tell were revealed to him by the Holy Spirit or by God. I think that's significant. So his his gospel begins really, that was just a preamble, but he begins in verse 5. And he says as follows, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zechariah, or Zechariah, of the division of Avia. The, the priests did not all serve in the temple at the same time. There were too many. And so they basically divided up all the priests into 24 divisions. In Hebrew, they're called mishmarot, or watches. And so this Zechariah, Zechariah, was from the division or watch named Avia. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. So his wife was actually from the priestly tribe, the priestly family. And her name was Elizabeth. That's obviously not a Hebrew name. Her Hebrew name would have been Elisheva. So what's interesting is that the gospel writer here, Luke, and again, I think it's important just to reiterate, we've said this in the past, that the manuscript of Luke does not say it was written by someone named Luke. None of the gospels tell you who wrote them. This is basically entirely based upon church tradition. But just for convenience sake, we'll, we'll say that the author was Luke. So he mentions that um, Zechariah, Zechariah, was from the division or the, the watch named Avia. Now, you can find the original 24 divisions. They're listed in First Chronicles chapter 24. So in First Chronicles chapter 24, verses 7 to 18, you have a listing of all 24 of the original watches. And Avia was the eighth. Avia was the eighth of these 24 watches. It's interesting that the ninth watch was someone named Yeshua. Yeshua was the person who was the head of the ninth watch. The problem here historically is that these 24 divisions that are listed in First Chronicles, they only serve during the time of the first temple. They only serve during the time of the first temple. Because after the exile in Babylon, we know that there was a destruction of the first temple and there was an exile to Bavel, to Babylon. And we know that when the people of Israel returned from Babylon, only four, only four of those 24 divisions returned to Judea. I mean, it was tragic that so many of the people did not return from Babylon. They didn't return from Babylon. About, I think, 42,000 approximately. That was it. Came back. And only four of the divisions, only four of those original divisions. And Avia was not one of them. You'll find this in the book of Ezra. Ezra mentions the watches that came back in chapter 2 of Ezra. Chapter 2 of Ezra, verses 36 to 39, mentions the four watches, the four watches that came back from Babylon, and Avia was not one of them. So that presents a bit of a problem here. How can Luke tell us that Ze Zechariah, 
who is now is living, obviously, the times of the second temple, that he's from the watch of Avia. Anyway, it, it's a technical problem, but one just worth thinking about. Now, in verse 6 of Luke, he goes on to say that they, now they here refers to Zechariah and Elisheva. They were both righteous. This is what, uh, William, you were referring to a few minutes ago. Luke says they were both righteous in the sight of God. They were righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments and requirements of the Lord. What we're hearing here is that Elisheva and Zechariah were able to keep the commandments faultlessly. Now, how many times have I heard from Christians, you can't keep the Torah? It's impossible to keep the Torah. You're not able to keep the Torah. But Luke testifies here that indeed, Zechariah and Elisheva kept the commandments of the Torah faultlessly. And they were considered righteous in the eyes of God. Now, Paul, in his epistle, Galatians, so in Galatians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul says that if you could be righteous by following the laws of the Torah, then Jesus died in vain. So Paul seems to be assuming that it's not possible, that it's not possible to follow the Torah and to be righteous. And yet Luke really sort of lets the cat out of the bag and says, no, it is possible. And he gives you two examples of people that were able to faultlessly keep the commandments of the Torah and they were deemed righteous in the eyes of God. In verses 8 through 10, we're told that Zechariah was chosen by Lot to enter the holy temple and to burn incense. There were many uh, services that were done in the holy temple each day, and one of those was to have an incense offering. And Luke says that the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. This is what Luke says, that Zechariah one day, there was a, how do they determine which priests would do which service and which priests were going to serve? So they, they had a lottery, they, they drew lots. And in this particular day, Zechariah won the lot to basically perform the incense service. And Luke says, this is again a detail that Luke throws in, that while he was doing this service, the whole multitude of people were in the outside and at the hour of the incense ser service, the incense offering, and they were praying. Now, the truth is that this was actually not the practice this is not what took place back then. People did not gather to pray at the time when the incense was being offered. And there's absolutely no reference to this practice that's found in any Jewish source. Now, if you study the Talmud, you'll find that they go through everything that took place when this temple service was going on in great great, great detail in the Mishnah and then expanded in the Talmud and the Gemara itself. Yet there's nothing, no mention of the fact that when the incense was being offered, people gathered outside in order to pray. And so this is just a little detail, again, that Luke trips himself up with because he shows really a lack of familiar familiarity with the temple service. He wasn't really knowledgeable about what took place in the temple. Now in verses 11 to 15, an angel comes to Zechariah in the temple 
to inform him that he and Elizabeth will have a son and they will call him Yohanan. In English, he's called John. And he will be a Nazarite from the womb, meaning that just like Samson, for example, or Samuel, so the son of Zechariah and Elisheva was going to be basically from his birth a Nazarite, which means he couldn't cut his hair and he couldn't drink wine and he couldn't come into contact with people that were dead. So that's the news that that uh, Zechariah is given in the temple by an angel while he's performing his service. In verse 16, Luke writes that, and he will, again, this is the continuing message from the from the angel, angel says, and he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Your son, who's going to be named Yohanan, he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Now, in Hebrew, this fellow named Yohanan, he was often referred to as Yohanan Hamatbil, Hamatbil, from the word Tevila, which means immersion, because he was Yohanan the Immerser. He, his practice was to, at the Jordan River, immerse people into the Jordan as part of a uh, repentance, part of a, the, the process of repenting. It was a symbol of purification. And so, in English, he's often called John the Baptist, which is a ridiculous term. He wasn't John the Baptist as opposed to John the Presbyterian or John the Lutheran. But basically, he would have been called, the, the better term would be John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer. So what, he, what did he do? He called upon the people of his generation to repent. He called upon the people of his generation to to repent. And he didn't imply ever, he never implied that you needed to believe in a Messiah in order to do this. Again, repentance means that you walk away from your sins, you distance yourself from your sins, you turn away from your sins, and you turn back to God. We know that Isaiah tells us in chapter 59 that your sins separate you from God. So repentance means that you turn away from your sin and you turn back to God. And that's exactly what John the baptizer, Yohanan Hamatbil, was doing at the Jordan River. He was calling upon people to repent, to do teshuva. And he never implied that it wasn't possible to repent. He never implied that they would not be able to turn away from their sins and turn back to God. He never implied that in order to be able to return to God, you need to believe in a Messiah. He preached that the kingdom of God was at hand. This was his major message. The kingdom of God is at hand. And that people could prepare for the coming kingdom of God, which basically meant the messianic age. In the messianic age, we're told that one of the things that will be happening is that the entire world will come to faith in God. As we see, for example, in the 14th chapter of the prophet Zechariah, he says on that day, God will be one and his name will be one. Many, many prophecies. The, the Hebrew scriptures have basically Dozens of prophecies which speak about the idea that in the messianic age, in the times of the Messiah, the whole world will come to know God. And so when Yohanan is saying the kingdom of God is at hand, what he's preaching is that this evil empire, the Roman Empire that's occupying Israel and that's imposing their idolatry upon the land of Israel they're going to be out of here soon, and God's going to be in control. God's going to be the one that's the king. 
So that's exactly what he was preaching. He was preaching the coming of the messianic age, which one of the terms you could use for that is the kingdom of God. And he said, you can prepare for this and actually hasten it. You can bring it about by turning back to God, by repenting. Now, what Yohanan was saying is that this is exactly in line with what we're taught in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible teaches that the one prerequisite for the redemption, the one prerequisite for the coming of the messianic age is for the people of Israel to repent, to return back to God. Again, we see this in the book of Devarim in Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 1 to 3. And we see it in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 20. And so this is a major teaching of the Hebrew Bible that the prerequisite in order for the Messiah to come and to have the messianic age and the kingdom of God, Israel has to repent. And that's exactly what John the baptizer, what Yohanan HaMatbil was preaching at the Jordan River. He was preaching for people to immerse themselves as a symbol of their purification, of their renewal, and that they should repent of their sins and turn back to God. And that prepares for the coming of the Messiah and it hastens the coming of the Messiah. Now in verse 17, Luke writes, and it is he, again, speaking about Zechariah's son who will be born. This is, again, the, the, the um, news that Zechariah is getting from the angel about this child that's going to be born to him. And the angel says in verse 17, and it is he, your future son, who will go out as a forerunner before him. Now, him here means the Messiah. That your son, Yohanan, is going to go out as a forerunner before him, him meaning the Messiah, in the spirit of and power of Elijah, that your son, Yohanan, again, John, is going to be a forerunner for the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's Elijah the prophet. To do what? The angel continues to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Again, the angel here is spelling it out to Zechariah that his son is going to basically play the role of Elijah the prophet, who's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And again, this all takes place, he says here, through the repentance that takes disobedient people and brings them to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is, again, exactly in line with what I just said, that the preparation for the coming of the Messiah has to be the repentance of the Jewish people. Now, what's interesting is that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 13, and in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 14. And again in Matthew, chapter 17, verse 13. They explicitly, explicitly have Jesus claiming that John the baptizer, that Yohanan Hamatbil, was Elijah the prophet in the flesh. So again, in Mark 9.13 and in Matthew 11.14 and Matthew 17.13, Jesus explicitly claims that John the baptizer is Elijah the prophet, is Elijah the prophet. The obvious problem with this 
is that in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 21, when John the baptizer himself, when Yochanan Hamatbil himself is asked by the people, are you Elijah the prophet? They ask him to his face, are you Elijah the prophet? John says, no, I am not. I'm not. <laughs> Jesus insisted that he was, and they ask him, so are you or aren't you? He says, no, I am not. So our verse here in Luke, our verse 17 here in Luke, seems to try to deal with this problem. It's a pretty big problem. And Luke tries to ameliorate this problem by saying, well, Yochanan HaMatbil, John the Baptizer, may not have actually been Elijah the prophet in the flesh. He may not have actually been Elijah the prophet in the flesh, but he came in the power and in the spirit of Elijah. That's how Luke tries to at least take the edge off of the problem here. It doesn't really solve anything because, again, in the Hebrew Bible, in the prophet Malachi, now again, in the Jewish version of Malachi, it's chapter 3, verse 23. In a Christian Bible, it would be chapter 4, verse 5 in the prophet Malachi. And he says, who is going to return in the future? So the Hebrew says, et Eliyah Hanavi. Et Eliyah Hanavi. Eliyah Hanavi means Elijah the prophet. What does the word et mean in Hebrew? So the truth is, it doesn't have a translation. It's not really a word that's translated. You could call it even a flavor word. And et in Hebrew, always precedes the direct object of a sentence. The little tiny word et precedes the direct object of a sentence. So Malachi is telling us who is going to come back in the future? Et, Eliyah Navi. My dear friends, hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Et Eliyahu Navi. It's Elijah the prophet. He himself will be coming in the future not someone else that's going to be coming in his spirit. This is very, very important. Meaning Luke might be trying to solve a problem by saying that John the baptizer is going to be coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, but that wasn't the prophecy of Malachi. Malachi is telling us that Elijah himself will return. And again, that's not so surprising because the Torah tells us, the, the, the prophets tell us, in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, that Elijah the prophet didn't die. He didn't die. And look, even if he died, we know that people could be resurrected and come back. But Elijah himself didn't die. He went up to heaven alive. And then, interestingly, there's a fascinating story in 2 Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 12, where Elijah, who already left the scene a long time ago, he sends a letter from heaven to King Jehoram. So Elijah the prophet, he basically is still kicking. He, he, he's like the ever-ready ever ready battery, ever-ready bunny, doesn't ever stop ticking. He's constantly around. And according to Jewish tradition, he literally makes appearances all the time. He never stopped. But this is what Malachi prophesies, that Elijah the prophet himself will return before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. What is day of the Lord? It doesn't mean a 24-hour period of time. The day of the Lord is that 
period of time. It's an era, an epoch where God will be one and his name will be one and God will be recognized and acknowledged as the king of the entire world. That's one problem. The second problem is that John the baptizer, not that we have any evidence, he did not turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers, nor did he turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. This is what Malachi tells us, that Elijah the prophet, when he returns, he's going to do this. And there's absolutely zero evidence or indication that John the baptizer did anything like that. So this is just a very, very problematic claim that the Gospels are making either explicitly, which is what you see in Matthew and in Mark, and really more sort of vaguely in here in Luke, but none of it works out. There's just absolutely zero connection between Yochanan HaMatbil, John the Baptizer, and Elijah the prophet. In verses 18 to 20, The angel Gabriel, who we're told appeared to Zechariah in the temple. This is the angel that was speaking to Zechariah in this story. And the angel was coming again to inform Zechariah that he and his wife, Elisheva, will have a boy, have a baby who will be named Yochanan. And he will be a Nazarite, so he'll be raised as a Nazarite. What happens when the angel gives this message to Zechariah? Zechariah says, how do I know this is going to happen? I mean, to him, it was pretty uh, strange news to hear because he says him and his wife are very advanced in years. This is almost like the story of Abraham and Sarah. You know, they're told they're going to be having a baby. Meanwhile, they're, uh, you know, Abraham's 100, she's 90. They're saying, what are you talking about? Have a baby. And so Zechariah feels the same way. What do you mean, Elisheva and I are going to have a child? We're just very, very old. So he says to the angel, how do I know? I mean, like, you know, he's very, he seems doubtful. He seems to be doubtful. So Gabriel says to him at this point that because he doubted, because he doubted the uh, the news, he will remain mute. He will not be able to speak until everything comes to pass. So until he actually has this child, Zechariah is not going to be able to speak. So in verse 21, What happens, back to the story now, the people were waiting in the temple, we're told. Again, this is where Luke gets himself into trouble. Luke says that the people in the temple were waiting for Zechariah to conclude the incense service. And they were wondering why he was delayed. The people seemed to be a little bit nervous, like what's going on with Zechariah? So, again, this is another example where Luke does not seem to be familiar with the temple ritual. Actually, it wasn't that one priest would be performing the incense service. That's the impression you get from Luke, that Zechariah went in to perform the incense service And all the people are standing around outside praying and waiting for him to emerge. And when he doesn't come out in the time frame that they expected, they get very nervous. But that's not what happened. Not only, as we saw before, was there nothing about the people gathering outside and praying while the incense was being offered. But the truth is that the incense service was not performed by one priest. There are actually quite a few priests that were involved with the different aspects of the incense service. It wouldn't have been Zechariah all by himself. We see this just if you want to check up on this, you can go to the Sepharia and look up the Mishnah, the Mishnah in Tractate Tamid, 
T-A-M-I-D. In chapter 5, mission is 4 through 6, and in chapter 6, mission is 1 to 3, and in chapter 7, mission is 1 to 2. The mission teaches you exactly how the incense service was performed, and it shows you all the different priests that were involved with the incense service. The only time it was really one person who was involved with an incense service was on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, where the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, all by himself. And he was supposed to carry out the service there promptly. He was not supposed to prolong his prayers inside the Holy of Holies, lest the people outside begin to worry. And you see this idea about the high priest not taking too long, that's taught again in the Mishnah, in Tractate Yuma, chapter 5, Mishnah 1. And so probably what happened, this is conjecture, but this idea of having one priest performing an incense service and people waiting on them and the importance of them not delaying so that people won't get worried, that would not be applicable to the incense service that John was supposed to be part of. What may have happened is that Luke may have confused the tradition and applied the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement ritual rules, to the incense service that Zechariah was performing. Uh, but again, if he really understood how the incense service was normally done in the temple, um, he wouldn't have composed his gospel story the way he did. It, the way John, the, the way Luke composes his account here shows really a lack of familiarity with what actually happened in the temple. In verses 22 to 23, when Zechariah finally comes out, he emerges, he couldn't speak to the people. He wasn't able to say anything. And he had to make signs. He had to somehow communicate with sign language. And because of this, the people, they came to the conclusion, they got the impression that maybe he was struck mute because he had a vision in the temple. Maybe he had some kind of a mind-blowing experience in the temple, and that's why he wasn't able to speak. And then what Luke says is, and again, this is another example of when he speaks too much, he gets himself in trouble. Luke says, when the days of his priestly service came to an end, he returned home. When the days of his priestly service came to an end, meaning that not only did he serve in the temple that day uh, performing the incense service, but he continued to serve in the temple. And when that period of time concluded, he returned home. The problem here is that from the time that Zechariah had his vision that day when he was performing the incense service and he was struck mute from that day. So a person who was mute was considered to have a physical blemish, a physical defect. And such a person would have been disqualified from serving in the temple. So how could Luke here speak about Zechariah going home after his days of priestly service ended? His days of priestly service would have ended as soon as he was struck mute. He wouldn't have continued in his service. That was what we call in Hebrew a mum. A mum is a blemish or a defect. And that would have disqualified him from serving in the temple. And we see this idea in the Mishnah of Bechorot, chapter 7, Mishnah 6. 
In verses 26 to 38, in verses 26 to 38, we have Luke's version of the virgin birth story that we first saw in Matthew chapter 1. And I'll share just a few observations about Luke's uh, account. What's interesting is that in Matthew's account of the virgin birth story, the Annunciation, that's what it's called, the Annunciation by the angel that Mary's conception would be through the Holy Spirit is told to Joseph. So again, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, the Annunciation by the angel is told to Joseph after Mary has already become pregnant. And we see that in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Again, the annunciation by the angel is to Joseph after Mary has become pregnant. But here in Luke, the annunciation is to Mary before she becomes pregnant. Now, what's interesting is that Christian apologists when they try to deal with all of these contradictions in the gospel stories, what they often say is that, well, it's like a car accident. And, you know, if you have, let's say, four eyewitnesses to a car accident, so each one of them will give a slightly different report because they have a different perspective. To one of them, maybe the car that crashed into the other car, maybe it was uh, dark blue, and maybe another of the eyewitnesses saw it as black. You know, you'll have those kinds of variation between eyewitnesses to a accident. And they'll say that's you shouldn't be so bent out of shape when you see the gospel writers uh, having different accounts. The problem is that, number one, the gospel writers were not eyewitnesses to anything. Luke already confessed this back in the beginning of the book. So there's no eyewitness account here. Number two, an eyewitness account might give you differences in something like, was it dark, dark blue, or was it black? You know, that kind of difference in in in. in uh, that's so minor and you could have a different perspective, but it wouldn't account, for example, between, uh, you know, whether the crucifixion took place on Passover or the day before Passover, meaning that you can't have a difference of opinion of what date it took place on. So this difference between Matthew and Luke in terms of when the Annunciation took place, well, that's not... A, uh, aside from the fact that there were no eyewitnesses, but that's not something that would be accounted for by uh, by the fact that differences have that that different witnesses have different perspectives. Either the Annunciation was before Mary became pregnant or after she became pregnant. Now, if as we read here, if as we read here in Luke. Mary, if Mary was told by the angel that she would conceive through the Holy Spirit. So one of the things we wonder is why she never told this to Joseph. Because in Mark, and in, in, sorry, in Matthew's story, in the story in Matthew, when Joseph comes home to say one day, jo Joseph comes home to see that Mary is what they say, great with child, that Mary is pregnant, Joseph flips out and he assumes that she was cheating on him and he's planning on divorcing her. Well, why didn't Mary tell Joseph that, listen, Joseph, I was visited by an angel and I was told that I'm going to be the mother of this special child, not through you, but through God's Holy Spirit. Why didn't Mary ever tell this news to Joseph? Another problem. 
what is Mary told here about this baby she's going to give birth to? So Mary is told that her son will be called son of the most high and that God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Now think about this. Mary is not only told that she's going to give birth to a baby, she's told something that's absolutely incredible about this baby. The baby, again, is going to be called the son of the most high God, and that God is going to give this baby the throne of his father, David. It means the throne of his ancestor, David. And he's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. And Mary was never told to keep this secret. So she gets this absolutely incredible news from the angel. She's never told to keep it secret. Now, also, I mean, we're going to make a point here, but I just want to say parenthetically that none of this was ever fulfilled. Jesus did not reign over the house of Jacob. Jesus never reigned for one minute. He was never anointed as a king. He never reigned as a king. And it's also important to just look carefully at what Mary was told. None of what she was told indicated that this baby would be God in the flesh. Again, for Christian Trinitarians and for Christians who put their faith in the idea that Jesus is the incarnation of God, none of that was told to Mary. But getting back to what she was told, she was told that this baby is basically going to be the Messiah. She's told that your child is going to be the Messiah. Yet, in chapter 3 in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, after a multitude of Jesus' disciples follow him home and they're crowding the house, there's no room, there's so many disciples. So Mark chapter 3, verse 21 tells us that his relatives wanted to take custody of him because they said he had lost his senses. And then in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 5, John says that his own brothers didn't believe in him. Now, what's going on? D did Mary not mention her news that she received from the angel to anyone? She never told her husband or her other children, look, you know, you got to treat little Jesus <laughs> with, with proper honor and respect because, you know, he's not just a little baby infant. He's going to be the Messiah of Israel. Well, you would think that that's the kind of news that you wouldn't keep to yourself. That's pretty significant, you know, because, of course, as the mother, Mary would want to make sure that the other children don't abuse or misabuse or torture little Jesus. He's a special child and you have to be taking care of him specially. So, again, it makes you wonder, did this ever happened? Did any of this ever take place? Was she told anything by an angel? Because again, if she was, those later stories don't make much sense. Another pro problem, obviously, is that if Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, then he would not have any Davidic lineage. We know that the Christian scriptures spend two chapters, Matthew chapter one, and we'll see in Luke chapter three, trying to prove that Jesus traces his genealogy all the way back to King David. But if he doesn't have a father from the tribe of David, from the line of David, he is not from the line of David. So this whole idea of him being born through the agency of the Holy Spirit, it really is a death blow to his claims to have Davidic descent. The one thing we can say about Luke that's positive is that at least he didn't embarrass himself by claiming that Jesus' virgin birth was predicted by the prophet Isaiah. At least Luke doesn't make that mistake. Now, 
in verses 46 to 55, what you have is Mary's song of praise to God for the birth of this child. Mary has a beautiful song of praise to God. And it's more or less a rehashing of Hannah, of Hannah's song to God after the birth of Samuel. It's basically more or less uh, a rehashing of that song. And then we have in the conclusion of this chapter, verses 68 to 79, we have Zechariah's song of praise to God. And I'm going to read it now, and you're going to see that it's very, very messianic. Now, uh, this again, th this is um, Zechariah's song of praise to God um, for the birth again of his son, uh, Yochanan, John the Baptizer. And if we listen to the words of his song of praise, we're going to see that he's describing uh, the messianic future in a way that is very Jewish, meaning that he's describing the messianic future in terms that are very, very different than the Christian understanding of what the coming of the Messiah is all about. So Zechariah says the following. Again, we're in chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1 of Luke, beginning with verse 67. His father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied, Praise to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He's come to redeem his people, meaning that he understands that he's obviously speaking about what's going to happen soon. If his son is going to be the precursor of the Messiah, so he's speaking about what's about to happen, God redeeming his people. And again, when we, when we speak about the Jewish Messiah, this comes up all the time. Let's just take a little bit of a detour before we go on to the end of the, prof, the, end of the book of Luke. So the end of the book of Luke in chapter 24, there's a very, very significant verse where Jesus is on the road after his alleged resurrection. This is the story as it's told. And he runs into two of his disciples. And they say the following. I'm just going to read verse 21. Chapter 24, verse 21. And they don't recognize Jesus, by the way. But they say to the person that they're seeing, we had hoped, we had hoped, that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That's what we had hoped for. He was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And you'll see that Zechariah in his song here basically is saying the same exact thing. So he says as follows. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. So important to recognize that he is using the Jewish understanding of this term called salvation. In his song, salvation doesn't mean that someone's going to die for your sins. Salvation means, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's another term for redemption, that you're going to be saved from your enemies. And that's what Zechariah says here. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies. Again, not salvation from our sins. We're going to be saved from our enemies. If you read the book, for example, of Judges, this is a phrase that you see throughout the book of Judges that God's going to raise up judges to save the Jewish people from their enemies. So this is exactly what Zechariah is saying here, that the coming of this Davidic Messiah, he's going to save us from our enemies. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. From all who hate us. 
to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So this is basically a song that is anticipating the messianic age in ways that basically are exactly what the Hebrew Bible says about the coming of the Messiah. Um, so that's what I wanted to share about Luke chapter one. I know it's a very long chapter. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like two chapters in one. Yeah. Um, but instead of doing it in two parts, we managed to squeeze it into one part. And next time we meet, God willing, we'll go on to chapter two. That sounds like a good plan. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Rabbi, for your time as usual. And uh, we will see you same time, same place next week. Hashem willing. And you should all be well. Take care, Rabbi. Thanks, everybody. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shafar